chapter 1, book of Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2. I believe we're going to have a lot of insight, revelation in this this morning. We're going to visit scriptures that you've seen, scriptures that you should know, uh, but we're going to look at it from a different angle this morning. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2. And the situation now is God just walked into this guy's tent one night unannounced, didn't turn around and say, would you like the position? Would you like the job? It's sure to know. God just walked in and said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, get up. Everybody shout, get up. Arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, unto the land that I do give unto them, even unto the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you. Uh, as I said unto Moses. The funny thing is, oh no, no, I'll get sidetracked if it's, if it's still, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in our night. As I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river and the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, unto the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I will not fail you, nor will I forsake you. That is an incredible promise, an absolute incredible promise. God was speaking this to a human being. He was making them a promise. I was, I was doing a meeting on Friday night, and when I was beginning to go down the line as I was doing a prophesy to people, I said something to somebody, and I turned around to Robert and said, write that down real quick, because it was one of them things that you don't normally think of. It just came out of my spirit when I said it. And, and, and I couldn't get away from it, so when I got home, I wrote it down again as much as I could remember. But I said this, your promise, has anybody here got a promise from God? Your promise is your invitation into your destiny. Your promise is the green light from heaven to go ahead and get it. It is your go-ahead, it is your, your promise is an access through a door that has been previously locked. When God says you, when he gives you the promise, it means it's time, it's open now, you can do it. It is your go-ahead, it's your qualification. It means simply now that you've got this word, you're now on your way. Look at somebody say, I'm on your way. We're on our way now. And you've got to understand that when you say, when God gives you these things, it's not that we heard it with our mind, but we saw it on the inside. You've got to learn to see what God is saying to you. You've got to see yourself possessing the land. You've got to see yourself going. You've got to see yourself having it. You've got to be talking about it. You've got to understand that this, the promises of God, the promises of God, they're all powerful, every single one, but as powerful dynamic to you when he speaks specifically to you with one scripture. You've got to look at it and look at it and dissect it and go over it and glean different things out of it at every time. I guarantee you God doesn't give you the whole revelation on the first scripture. He builds it up and builds it up till you'll see more and more and more. I've preached these scriptures before, but I look at it and I'm seeing new things and new things and new things. I tell you, when you believe the promises of God, then it's literally true. Now nothing will be impossible unto you. If God said it's yours, then it's yours. Nothing will be impossible unto you. Nothing will be able to outsmart you because God said you can have it. All reason Sources that you need wherever and whenever are right there for you to accomplish what God has for you. It brings a protection round about you. It means the devil can't kill you because you have a promise from God that says you'll live long and you'll prosper. It means no matter what you do, no matter when you're doing it, it's going to work. It simply means because you have a promise, you're unstoppable. Look, just smile at somebody and say, unstoppable. Now, when the Bible promises you, when the, when the Word of God speaks to you and promises you that you're going to have some gain or you're going to take some ground or you're going to go to the next level or, or at least now we have the, the, the chart for the rest of our life. When he does it, when the Bible speaks to that, then you can almost guarantee, you can guarantee it's the beginning of a battle, that war is about to start. 
because that enemy knows that if he lets you run that promise, he'll have to back down, and all those things God has said to you will surely come to pass. So he goes out from what the first minute it said, he goes out to try to stop you, to back down, to get you not to believe the promise, to back off the promise so that he, let, he can limit you from all that you're meant to do. So you've got to understand when the promise comes, when the promise comes, then, then, then you've got to understand, th there'll be this challenge on the inside of you to rise up to take it. If it's big enough, if it's coming through you, let me tell you, then it'll probably either scare you, make you afraid, or you, you'll begin to doubt. But you've got to get over the doubt, and you've got to say, wait a minute, if God said it, then I can have it, and I'm going to finish it. It will mean that there's going to be a fight. Look at somebody say, there's going to be a fight. It's probably not just going to come to pass there's, there's wars you'll have to fight. You're going to have to step out of some things, and you're going to have to step up and face some things. The promises of God will cost you. If you think it's all automatic, you've got another thing coming. You have to become a warrior in the kingdom of God to fight for those things that, he has, that He's given you to. But let me tell you something, there's a cost to every promise, but it's well worth it when the answer comes. When you begin to live in that and say it, man, it's, it's extreme. It's worth it, it's worth it, it's worth it. And the funny thing is, when God just walked into this man's tent and began to tell him, you're the man, now you're going to bring all them people over. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He never mentioned he never mentioned what this fella was going to have to go through. Never mentioned it. Just told him, I'm going to be with you. It's going to be glorious. We're going to take the whole nation. Never mentioned that there was going to be a fight. Never mentioned there was going to be opposition. Never mentioned there was going to be challenges or difficult time or difficult people. When in reality, it simply meant there's now war. War has now begun. He said this in a, in, a, in a few verses later. He says, be strong now. God said this to the man. Be strong now and be of, of a great courage. For unto, unto this people you'll divide the inheritance of the land and you, they swore unto the fathers to give them. But only be strong now and be very courageous that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein that, at which I commanded Moses my servant. Now don't turn from the left or don't turn to the right that you may prosper or be successful or whatever you go to do. For I have commanded thee, be strong. Three times now, be strong and be of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dis d dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with you, whithersoever thy go. Now he didn't really mention any battles. He didn't tell them that. But I've always said, you don't have to be a Sherlock Holmes to work it out. When God's telling you now, be, don't be afraid now. Be very courageous now. Now, don't get discouraged. You, you, can, you, understand, you can read between the lines and you realize there's something about to come into my future here that's going to terrify me. There's something so God tells us in advance. In fact, all God told the guy, first of all, was there's this huge stretch of land. And for my benefit, uh, being checking this out on the computer, I put up the map of, of, of the, the, where the children of Israel possessed the land. And it's massive, a massive chunk of land. He said it was from the wilderness of the Lebanon, over there to the sea, over here to the great sea, from the river Euphrates down here, over to the land of the Hittites away up here. He described, he said, here's where we're going. His promise wasn't some small thing, I promised to get it right for Christmas. He was telling them, we're going to take a nation. We're going to do it, and we're going to do it right. And you need to know this, son, that there's nobody will be able to stand before you all the days you life. Look, if I was prophesying that to you in a line, you'd be, you'd have one eye open to see who's looking. Are you getting this down on record? Did you hear what he said to me? I'm going to take the land. They're going to have a new house. I'm, I'm going to be something special. Yeah, that's right. Look at somebody say, that's right. God promises. But Joshua knew exactly what he was saying because God added a little line in there that we would just not think about. But he said, listen, he said, he said, I want, here's, here's the land from the river Euphrates and all the land of the Hittites. Everybody shout, the Hittites. You almost think the Hittites was kind of some sort of sheep farmers. You almost think that the Hittites was a, like four people in a mud hut, and they'll never stop you, Joshua. Uh, Joshua kind of knew different, because the Hittites were not farmers, and the Hittites were not peasants. 
In fact, at that time when Joyce was alive, the Hittites was the most advanced civilization in the world. The one who would conquer them, would be, they even conquered Syria and the Assyrians. The only one that could beat them and just beat them by a hair's breath was Egypt. So Egypt became the next ruling empire. But in their days, the Hittites was the ruling empire. They were the most advanced civilization. They had bronze, they had brass, and they had iron when nobody else had it. They had weaponry. They built their cities on the mountainsides in fortresses, huge weapons walls around them. They put them so high on the rock face that ordinary people couldn't get to them for their protection. They built it in the most mountainous of terrain, like Afghanistan. You know, the, the, the hardest war to fight was the Afghanistan war because it was in the mountains and the people could hide in the rocks. And so it was, for nobody ever won the battle in Afghanistan. They, they, some people claim it, but they never did. You can't win it. It's that type of warfare. And the Hittites owned the whole mountainous terrain and built it up in there. And, and they, all the trade routes of the world and then just came down through it. They, so because the trade was coming through, coming through their cities, their cities were the wealthiest on the face of planet Earth at that time. They had mines because of the mountains, so they had all the resources. They sold the resources. The wealthiest, wealthiest, most advanced civilization in the world. They had commerce that nobody else was into. They had weaponry that nobody else had ever made. In fact, later on, when King David sat on the throne, he went to buy uh, military warfare for his armies, and he bought horses, and he bought the chariots made of iron, from the Hittites. This is the crew. This is not some sheep farmer somewhere. This is a, this is a massive place. Their, their war, uh, armies were so well trained. In fact, one of David's, what he called his mighty men, when he began to, to set up his military warfare and his armies, one of his mighty men, captain of his hosts, happened to be a Hittite. It was a land of giants. These were not small guys. These were not just pushover people. This was a land of giants. It was also a land of kings because all the cities of the Hittites come under different regions and every region has a king. So now, you, you don't need a king. We got, we, if you had all of Ireland... We would, one king would do us. So you can understand the stretch of the land, the amount of might, the amount of comforts that they had to have so many kings over the place. Not only that, these were smart cookies and they had alliances with other nations round about so that they, when they would go to war, if they ever had to go to war, they had buddies to fight with them. They were not just a nation. They were an empire. In fact, when I began to read this, I wrote down another word beside it. They were a super state. And when God walked into a tent that night, he didn't turn around and say, we're going to a few hill farmers and we're going to put them out, son. He said, there's a ruling empire there. And he said, get your people together and get your shoes on, Sammy, because we're going over there and we're not going to rout a few sheep farmers and a few peasants. We're going to take down a super state. We're going to invade a nation that's invadable. We're going to move with what we have. And God says, I will not fail you, son. I'm going to... You you think you got a little promise going and you're struggling? Here's this man coming out of a tent who never went to military warfare school, but he's got his God saying to him, if it's, have I said it's coming down, Joshua? It's coming down. Look at somebody say, it's coming down. And all Joshua had was a word from God to invade a nation that was invadable. You couldn't do it. You didn't. It was the, 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 the top army of the day. You couldn't do it. And God walked into this man and said, we'll see it's done. You, uh, jo uh, Joshua, Joshua, all I need is somebody that will run with me. I'll do the rest. Look at somebody say, this is exciting. Because in the end of the day, military might, commerce, and all its civilized advancement means nothing to God. For when God turns around and said, Son, listen, they're sitting on your land. The Hittites are in there at the minute, but it's really yours. That promise I'm making you right now will push those people out. It may be invaded. It may look impossible. It may look like it's not going to come to pass, but do exactly what I tell you. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't think about it. Keep going, and you'll get there. God is not intimidated by the threats of the enemy. 
God is not intimidated by your bills. God is not intimidated by the words of human beings. The threats of mortal men doesn't threaten God. It threatens man. I was talking to a man last night. He was telling me he was in this, this uh, 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 Christian uh, huge Bible school. They were having a board meeting, etc. Uh, 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 they were talking about the money that they needed to keep the whole thing flowing and going. And he said, I'm sitting there as a prophet of God. Listen, they invited him in, you know, along with about 20 or people. He said, they're talking about the money here and the money there. And, and uh, he, said, he said, my spirit man was rising up on the inside. And he said, they were going on. We don't know how we'll pay this. We'll have to shut down this and we'll have to cut this off. He said, I could stick it no more. He said, I stood to my feet. He said, excuse him, why? I may be out of turn right here because I don't know how your board meetings work. Write the minutes down. He said, but aren't we? we believers? Aren't we people of God? Aren't we people that, that, that believes that God can? And don't we teach it in our, in our Bible schools that God can? Why don't we find out how much we need? Then why don't we pray as a prayer of agreement in here? Then he told them one or two stories about how they were coming through bills and how God met their bills. And so, so he said, how much exactly do we owe? And we'll pray it right now. He said, my faith was up to you. I was ready. He said, so the young treasures do his feet, coughed twice, opened his billfold. He said, we need 200, 200 million dollars. He said, I wanted to sit down again real quiet. <laughs> he said, I was thinking maybe two million, you know. So this young guy, he got up and he said, 200 million dollars. He said, my stomach lapped over and my voice was inside. There's a voice saying, what have you got? Why don't you just sit down, please? <laughs> so he said, I'm this far down on a limb. I just had to turn around. And nobody knew and I was quaking on the inside. So I just turned around saying, it's nothing to the Lord. Let's Look at somebody say, be very courageous. There's some situations you'll find yourself in that you'll be intimidated by the size of the bill, by the size of the doctor's report. You will be, you will be uh, almost knocked back by the size and there's something inside you that says we can't. But let me tell you, God is not intimidated by $200 million. God is not intimidated by our lack. He is not intimidated by our threats. God knows how to deal with them. In fact, God knows how to put one or two threats back himself. In the book of Daniel chapter 5, it's a tremendous story because the king of the day called Belshazzar, he, uh, he, was, he was boozing, he was partying, he was barbecuing people, he was having a whole, a whole debauchery going on right, left, and center, and probably he could have got away with it till he started talking about God, Jehovah, and trying to make fun and make light of God and God's people, and it kind of ruffled God up a bit, and God could stick it no longer so he stuck his hand down through the atmosphere and all of a sudden while they're partying there's a hand came out of nowhere that would freak you out there's a hand came out of nowhere and on the plaster of the wall it would be like our, our, our video machine here just a hand not the just a hand just appeared out of the atmosphere and began to write something. And whenever it wrote, it wrote "Mini, Mini, tackle you farson." And when they looked at it, they all looked and said, "What does this mean?" They, God was writing in tongues. As you see, he was, he was writing in tongues. There's nobody there could interpret. Why did he not just write in Median so that they, or Chaldean, that they can understand? No, he wrote it in tongues so it would need an interpretation. And they had to send for Daniel. And Daniel came up and said, yeah, yeah, meaning, meaning, tackle you first. And they said, well, what does it mean? What does it mean? And so God read out the order. It says, meaning means God has numbered your kingdom and finish it. This was the ruling kingdom of the day. Nobody could withstand this kingdom. And, and they probably could have got away with a lot of stuff till they talked against God. And the hand came out of nowhere and wrote down this. And they said, your God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Look at somebody say, it's over. He said, you've been weighed and tried in the balances you found wanting. And, and your farcing is, your kingdom now is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar, they, he brought Daniel over, because Daniel had interpreted the tongues written on the wall. He brought Daniel over, so happy that Daniel, I don't think the guy got the message, because if somebody told me it's over, I wouldn't be happy. 
But anyway, this guy was probably so full of wine or whatever, he didn't kind of get the whole deal. But he brought Daniel over. He said, you're the man, Daniel. So he brought him, he put a scarlet robe upon him, a, a nice coat. He put a chain of gold upon his neck, and he made a proclamation concerning Daniel that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel came from nowhere. He didn't even go to night tack or an open university. Now suddenly he's up here, he's got the chain on, and he's got a robe on, and he's third in position in the kingdom. Unfortunately for Belshazzar, that's the last statement that he's ever going to make. That's the last public announcement he's ever going to make because there's a full stop at the end of it, and then it first starts off with verse 30, and it says, And in that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius took the kingdom, being 32 years old. A young fella came in and killed him. I tell you something, when God said it's over, it's over. And the ruling party of the day, the greatest nation of the day, when God said, <laughs> son, let me tell you, here's a message on the wall. It'll not stand. You have got to get this in your thinking. When God made you a promise, there is no man, there is no devil, there is nothing can stop that from coming to pass because that is God's word. You need to look at it again and say, God, here's what you promised me. You've got to understand there is no power like the power of our God, cities and nations. I don't have the power that God has. And he said, to, God said to Joshua, this nation, this super, this super state cannot stand before me. All I need, Joshua, is somebody that will do what they're told, believe what I'm saying, and go in and take it. And he said, I'll do it. The book of Philippians chapter 2, it says in verse 9, it says, Wherefore God then has highly exalted Jesus Christ, given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should buy of things in heaven, things under the earth, things under the earth, that every tongue then should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The things that's laughing at you, the things that's mocking you, the debt that mocks you, the sickness that hounds you, the things that's standing in your way must buy its knee. If God has said it, then it must buy its knee because God is ultimately all power. And he said this in Matthew 28 and verse 18. He says, all power, Jesus Christ said this, all power now is given unto me. All power, not half power, not some power, not a little power. All power, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. In fact, Jesus Christ said this one time to some people who was threatening him. In John 19 and verse 11, Jesus answer says, you could have no power, no power at all against me, except it was given to you from above. All power, all power, and the one who gives all power is inside you. What is it that's stopping you? What is it that's hindering you? It can't hinder you. It may be able to slow you up, but it can't finish you. Let me tell you something. God has made you promises. And when he spoke to this man that day in the tent and told him, he said, we're going in there. We're going to take the land from here to here to here. And he mentioned the Hittites. The minute he did that, Joshua would have known straight away what he, he was not asking him to do some small thing. But Joshua didn't go back to sleep and say, call me at another time. I'm not available at the moment. No, he said, well, whatever it takes, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. In fact, when you go further and begin to scan through that I did yesterday in Joshua 12 and verse 24, it tells you how many kings that was in, the, in that area that he was about to invade. It tells you in Joshua 12 and verse 24, it says, all the kings were 31, 31 kings lying ahead of him. And this is what God said, son, we're going to take them down. You think you got a problem? He's 31 problems ahead of them. Every one of them is probably bigger. When you hit the first one, the news will travel. They're going to gang up. They're going to put siege right. They're going to get ready for your coming. But God says, I won't fail you, son. I'll give you tactics you never thought of. I'll make a way where there is no way. I'll go this way. We'll go that way. Just listen to what I tell you, and I will begin to do it. Let me tell you, when God promises you something, sometimes it takes a lifetime. Usually if you can finish it in 24 hours, God wasn't in it. The things that really matter is the things that call your destiny, the things that we're going to pursue for the rest of our days. It'll take you a lifetime. It says in Joshua chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, Now Joshua 
was old and stricken in years. I like this scripture. Listen to this. Joshua was old. Now he went in. He went in. He started to do battle. He's taken down different kings. He's doing it. But the Bible says, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years. And the Lord said unto them, You're old and you're stricken in years. <laughs> I like that. I like that. God didn't come and turn around and say, Ah, oh, you're a young fella. Nah, you can. No. God just was honest with them. Look at somebody say, God, just, God was honest. He said, You're old. You're old. And you're stricken in years. But there remaineth yet much land to be possessed. It's taken him a lifetime now to plow his way halfway through this thing. He's, he's well on his way. He's doing more than Moses ever did. He's doing more than any other ever person ever done in moving and advancing the kingdom of God. But it's not finished. And the problem now is he's getting old. He's a bit creaky getting out of bed in the mornings. It takes more, it takes more cups of coffee to get you wakened than it did five years ago. You want to, but the legs just won't drive you the same way. You, you go to shout to the army and a, a little squeak comes out because you're a bit rusty in the morning. Hey, here's what he said, and even God said, I know. <laughs> he said, you're old. Everybody, no, 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 no. He said, you're old, and, and, and he said, you're, you're old and you're stricken in years. But God says, I don't care about that. He said, there remaineth yet much land to be possessed. Age doesn't count when it comes to fulfilling the things of the kingdom of God. There is no retirement in the kingdom. Of, did you get this? It's all right, if you're 19, you're not even thinking about this, but those that's a little bit beyond 19, listen to me, there's no retirement. You probably, when you get to 68, when you get to 86, you probably still haven't finished at all. And I don't know what age this man was, but I'm probably in the near his 90s when God said to him, you're old now, son, and you're stricken. But listen to me, there's still much to be conquered. You haven't run the race entirely. You haven't finished it. When I read that, just, I understood yesterday that I'm not finished. I've done a lot of stuff. I've been a lot of places. I've seen a lot of things. But I got it down inside me yesterday that I haven't. The best is still to come. Look at somebody say, the best is still to come. Oh, I got places. I got mountains to run. I got, there's thousands. I'll stand in front of multitudes, multitudes that you can't even count. There's so much on the end because there's so much of the kingdom that has not yet been possessed. And even though the man's time was running out, God says, it doesn't matter, son. It's not over. Look at somebody say, it's not over. In fact, he put a scripture in for you in Isaiah 40 and 29. He says, he gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases your strength. Even the youths, that's the young fellows. Even the young fellows will faint and be weary. Uh, 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 but, the young, but the older ones, he'll say, but they that wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and they'll not be weary. And they'll walk and they'll not be faint. Look at somebody say, get out of my road. <laughs> Even the young fellows. I was talking to a man over the weekend. He, this man's 77. 70, where he is is in Texas. And the sun's blazing down and tells me the weather forecast. I don't, I don't really want to know, but he says 100 degrees. That's hot. I don't know what that is in our calculation, but 100 degrees is hot. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm resting right now. I said, I'll just take it easy at your age. He says, I'm only back in because I run two mile. Two mile. In a hundred degree heat. He said, I'm slowed down a bit, Joe. I didn't even want to say anything. I haven't even got started in this weather. Running two miles in heat. He says, I'm a bit under the weather when I had to lie down when I come in and put a cold towel over, put a cold towel over him with all the sweat that I lost. He says, I used to be able to do it quicker. Oh, <laughs> look at somebody say, get out of my way. God said, I know you're old and you're stricken, son, but I'm about to increase your strength. I'm about to put some more life on the inside of you. I'm about to put some zap inside there so that you'll knock the fellas out of the road and you'll keep going because we have much yet land to be possessed. God told him in a tent one night, we're going to take it. He's living out his promise. He's not there yet and he's old. So God keeps him alive till he goes a bit more. Let me read you this. This is hard reading, this one, because there's big words in it. But in Joshua 13 and verse 2, the land yet remaineth. This is what he hasn't taken. He's about 
90 and he hasn't finished it. He says, all the borders of the Philistines, all the Jezurites, all the Sar- S- S- all Ammons, which is before Egypt, which is in the border of, of Akron northwards, which is, a, which is counted on the, Cana- the Canaanites, five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites, the Ashdothites, the Eskalonites, Esk- the Gedites, the Akronites, the Avites, from the south, all the land of the Canaanites, the Mirez, uh, which is beside uh, Sid- uh, the Sidonians, even on the Aphak, to the borders of the Amorites, to the land of the, 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 the Giblites, and all, and all of Lebanon towards the rising of the sun, from, from Bilgal unto the Mount Hermon, even unto the entrance of Hamoth, and all the inhabitants of the hill country of Lebanon, even unto that big word, and all the Sidonians, and it says, them, I will drive them out before Israel. That's a lot of stuff he still hadn't done. All the battles, all the wars that he had fought. He had, whenever he was growing up with Moses, Moses had to fight battles, one or two, and he was in them battles. But here he is right now. Here he is right now, an old man, and God still says, the promise isn't fulfilled, son. We've got to do it. We've, I'm keeping you alive. Look at somebody say, he's keeping me alive. I'm keeping you alive because we have stuff to do. We have places to go. We got things to do. Let me tell you, don't panic now. Quit your panicking about, will I ever get it done? Will I be, can I do it? God will keep you alive to get it done. He'll move heaven and earth for you because you're his champion. Look at somebody say you're sitting beside a champion. If he promised you, if he promised you, then the reason he promised you is because he knew you could make it. He knew you could make it. Of course there'll be battles. And he didn't tell you that when he started, but there will be battles. But he knew very well that you're well able to cope. You're well able to come through. Or he wouldn't have chosen you in the first place. He would have given it to your sister. He would have given it to your brother. But no, no, no. He knew you could handle this. He knew you could do it. So buckle up. Put your shoulders back and your chest out and your chin up because it's not over. There's still much land to be possessed. Jesus said in John 15 and 16, he says, you did not choose me. You did not choose me, but he says, I have chosen you. You were chosen. He chose you for such a time as this because he knew you could do it. He knew you, hey, he knew you'd moan and complain, but he knew you could do it. Look at somebody say, I know you can do it too. He knew you could do it. He knew you could overcome this. He knew you could push through. He said, I've not only chosen you, but I have ordained you. That means strategically placed you. You you have been strategically placed right now for where God to do whatever he wants to do and ordained you that you should go forth and bring, bring forth fruit and that your fruit shall remain. In other words, I'm I'm strategic new place, placing you and setting you up to succeed. That's what God says about you. That's why you have a promise, because the promise is your go-ahead from heaven. Your promise is your qualification. That's the sheriff's badge. When hail stands against you, you just hold the promise up and say, you can't stop me because God has said, I can do this. And the Bible tells us, if you were to read on in, in Joshua 24, when you come to the end of Joshua's life in verse 17, then it says, and it says, For the Lord our God is he that brought us out, brought us up of our fathers out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, who did great signs and wonders in our sight, and he preserved us all the way that we went in amongst the people whom we passed. And the Lord drove them out before us, all the people, even the Amorites that dwell in the land. And therefore we also serve God, for he is our God. He said God brought us through every single... He's at the end of his days. He's having his last speech. He said God brought us. We we finished the wars. We annihilated. We pushed back and we conquered. And the Bible has the tribute at the last, the last words uh, to say about Joshua is this. In Joshua 24 and verse 29. And it came to pass that after those things, that's when he finished what God had asked him to do. It all started in a tent at midnight on a promise. We've got a big job, Joshua, but I won't fail you, son. I'll be with you. It ends now. It ends in the mountains of Ephraim. 
It ends away in the hill place when he's finished and the sword is put up and, and, he, and he's an old, old man. He's in his hundreds now and he has the shield put up on his tent and he sits and watches the sun goes down and looks at the sword and shield and thinks about all the battles, all the things and all the things they conquered for the Lord. It came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being a hundred and ten. A hundred and ten. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance. In the borders of his inheritance. Where Joshua started off was not on a border. Where Joshua was started off was away over in the far right hand side. By the time he had finished, he had pushed across the, the rivers. He had conquered the mountains. He had went up as far as the Hittites and drove them out, annihilated an empire, planted his kingdom and came right back down again to the hills and finished it in the hills. He said, I ran the race. I finished my course. I'm now going home. He was 110 years old and they buried him in the border. In other words, he walked the borders. He conquered the borders. To conquer the borders, you've got to conquer the internals. He conquered it. And after that, they began to distribute the land that they took and give it out to the 12 tribes of Israel. They took it because of one promise to one man. If God has promised you something, it's an entrance into your destiny. If God has promised you something, if you're walking it out, he will keep you alive till it's finished. If you will walk on that promise and stick with that promise day and night, he will, he will flourish you. He will, he, will, he will give you things that nobody else has ever. People will get jealous over you. Of course, there's battles to fight and there's rights to be, there's wrongs to be righted and there's judgments to be made. But if you'll do exactly what God says and don't fail him, he will never fail you. He'll give you maybe one promise in your lifetime, but that's all you need. That will open doors, that will close doors, that will drive you here, move you back. It will add people to you. It'll push people away from you. But your years will soon go by, and Joshua's years went by. But he had something to talk about. He could talk to his grandchildren and says, would I tell you about the big Hittite? Would I tell you about the giant we met over there? He had stories to tell. I don't think you were ever born to get up at 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock and just go and do factory work from 9 to 5, go home, get your tea, plant a few plants in the garden, and then go to bed and get up and let the cycle of life start all over again. I don't think you were ever born to do that. That's something you do because you missed a promise, because God has something on the inside of you that he needs you to do. You were born to do it. And if you don't do it, God has to raise somebody else up to do what you wouldn't do. <coughs> he'd do it. He'll, he'll raise somebody else up. While you're sitting watching TV, there's somebody else in a room studying. While you're, while you're sitting lying on the, on, the, on the couch and reading the Belfast Telegraph, there's somebody else that's in a room opening the book of Leviticus and crying unto God and saying, show me, show me, show me. And if you don't do what God's asked you to do, God will raise somebody else up. They'll never do it exactly like you because you were the one that was formed and fashioned and made to do it. But God will get the job done. At the end of the day, it's not about us. At the end of the day, it's about the expansion of the kingdom of God. And God will win a nation. And God will, God will take Ireland for the kingdom of God. He's already doing a great job right now. He's raising people up to say, to do, to take authority and make leadership. He's doing it. But if they don't do it, if they don't do it, God will raise somebody else up. They'll miss their trophies. They'll miss their crown. But God will get his kingdom established. Are you with me? So if there's a promise inside you this morning, you've got to understand that that promise, that promise is the power from God that's resident inside you now. Along with the promise comes the authority. Along with the promise comes the power. I want to talk about some things tonight that will try to hinder you. I want to talk about those things that will hinder you from your birth. There's at least four different things that you've got to fight. There's things, two, two, it talks in, 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 in and we're going to talk about this tonight, but in, 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 in the book of Chronicles, it talks about when David was going to establish, the word, the word it puts is establish dominion. I like that. When I read that, I thought, look at that for a scripture. He, when David went to establish his dominion, there's four things stood on his road. Those same four things stand in our road. For you to establish your dominion, 
your authority. Your authority is in the promise God gave you. If he promised you're the redeemed of the Lord, there's power and authority in that. What else has he promised you? Because his promise is his power. His promise to you is his authority to you in that region. You've got to learn how to establish your dominion to get it done. We're going to talk about that tonight. But right now, what you need is already inside you. If you're a believer now, God has probably spoken to you about something or talking to you about something right now. It may be something that you, you didn't have to deal with a year ago, but you're dealing with it now because you're moving on. He's moving you through the minefield. He's moving you through the complexity of life. He's shifting. He, he changes it. God reserves the right to change your life at any time. God, God alone can do it. You say God doesn't change his mind. He changes his strategies every now and then. And he'll do things. He'll say, okay, you've, you've walked this mountain far enough. Now you've circled this mountain far enough. You've done the same thing in and out, in and out for 20 years. It changes. Today it changes. We're not doing this anymore. God will change you. He'll change your world. He'll say, I don't want you going to that church anymore. I don't want you visiting them anymore. I don't want you, I don't want you watching that anymore. I don't want you putting tea. I don't want you putting sugar in your tea. My God can say anything. But when he says it, it means he's making an inroad. It means he's moving you out of where you are to where he needs you to be for a reason. If he closes one door, if he closes one door, it's because he's already got another door already swinging open over here. And the problem is doors that swing. There's an old message I was working on there about four different doors you'll have to go through in your lifetime. And you, something about you need to know about doors, some doors stay open all the time. You just, sometimes I'm shouting at the kids, close that door, you know that. And then you come back and the door's open again. You know what I'm saying? But there's other doors in your lifetime that they only open for a minute. Some of them are time-released. Some is on a timer, and it only opens five minutes, and it closes again. You don't even have to put a hand on it. It's on a timer. It closes itself. And you have got to get in. You've got to get It's like a musician. When the musician's playing, and they have what you call the introduction. And some of them introductions are wonderful. Sometimes it's just a violin going. Sometimes it's a lead guitar going. And, and, and the musicians is there, and they know the beat. You have an eight-bar beat or a 16-bar, whatever, and the beat's going, do, 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 do. And the musician automatically knows at a certain time, whenever you come to this in the introduction, this is when, this, this is when we start to sing. Or this is when it all hits and we do it. And the musicians know it's, it's written on our music or else it's rehearsed. Now, if you happen to come in before the door opens, it throws everything out because everybody's looking at each other. Should we, should we be starting? Should we? What are you doing? You know what I'm saying? If you're a musician, you know what I'm talking about. On the other hand, is this: when, if, the, if, if the introduction goes and, and, and something happens, a fly goes on your mic and you miss the introduction, you've got to play the whole introduction. Now, now, the people doesn't know. They think it's a part of the setup. But every other musician says, she missed it, she missed it. And you've got to wait till the introduction's played all over again before you can stop because they are doors. They are doors of access. They're doors of entry. And in your meeting your destiny, there's doors. There is doors will open to you. Some of them only open for a second. And sometimes God will help you. Sometimes God will help you. God needed Joseph one time to be in the palace. And Joseph wouldn't go. Why should he go? He's, he's the younger one at home. He's spoiled. He's got, the, he's got the PlayStation. He's got his daddy's Ferrari. He can have the peck of the camels. He can get the box office seats when you go to the rugby box. This guy's spoiled. He has it everything. God says, son, I give you all the dreams about going over there. We're going. He's not going anywhere. So God says, fasten your safety belt, son. And life tips him upside down. The next thing, he's not got the PlayStation with him. He's not even got his credit, daddy's credit card with him. He's in a pit in a desert. Next thing, he's out of the desert. But guess what? In a few minutes now, he's over here where God needs him to be. It's better to go gently. Look at somebody say, better to go gently. <laughs> Just do what he wants you. So if God closes a door, if God closes a door, don't dare sit there and cry. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Don't do it. Because God might have just shut a door. And the minute one door shuts, there's another one already swinging open. If you're going to sit at a door that's closed and cry for the rest of your days, this door will close. And now you're left in limbo because you can't get this one open and this one's closed. There's a timing. There's a timing in the things of God. You don't have time to mess with this. That's why when God says to you, here's a promise. I promise I'll bring you out 
I promise I'll do things with you, but as long as you hold here, we can't go. We can't do it. You know what you need to do? Whatever it is, kiss it goodbye. I don't care what the paper says, and I don't care what your granny says. As long as you sit at a closed door, this door's opening momentarily. Well, listen, I can't get it open because you're still sitting in a closed one. And it's only when you leave the closed one that suddenly, whew, where did that come from? It was there all along. But you weren't getting it until you follow the plans and the purposes of Almighty God. I'm helping you this morning. Oh, we got deeper stuff to talk about tonight. You can't go to, you can't, when I go preach in places, you can't preach stuff like that everywhere because they don't understand. But I'm talking about your promise. Well, Joe, I just thought we get a wee promise and you stand in a wee promise and then it all comes to pass. We. Some wee stuff does. But when we're talking about things that matters about life, when we're talking about serving God, making an impact for a, in a nation or a family, or doing something above and beyond what the norm is, then you've got to follow the instructions. And if you've already got a promise, you already have instruction number one. You already have it, and that's your qualification now to run the race. That's your qualification. Everybody wants to do it. Everybody wants to be a Joshua, but nobody really wants to pay the price and face the Hittites. There's something that's, and we're closing. Hey, 10 to 6, I preached long this morning. <laughs> There's something worth noting. When God spoke to Joshua and he says, he said this, this is, this is particular what he says, he says, he says, rise up and he says, I'm not sure where to get into this or not because it takes a while to explain, but he says, he says, no, we'll leave that to the night. We'll leave that tonight. Father, I just thank you this morning for everything you've been saying and doing. I thank you for the riches. I thank you for your promises. They do make us rich, and they add no sorrow to us. Your promise heals us. Your promise brings them through. But there's a battle, and there is a fight, and we've not understood that. So as we've given up in the middle, and we've got weary, and we got tired, and we thought, we thought everybody was against it, when really it wasn't. The promises on the inside pushing us, persuading us. We're stronger now than we ever were. We're doing more. We're affecting more people. We're, we're a greater influence now than we ever were in our lifetime before. If you're closing the door, thank you for closing it because we didn't want to sit at somewhere that's not working. But you're opening doors. Thank you for opening doors to us. Thank you now, Father. You're helping us make the decision. You don't make the decisions for us. You just suggest and then we go through them. But we say yes to every one of your suggestions. We say yes. We don't want to waste our life. We don't want to get to 99 and then look back and say, well, that was a waste of time. We want to say we made it count. We made it count. We did something in this generation. Thank you for the promise that's now on the inside of me. Thank you for health and healing. This cancer cannot remain. This, this ulcer cannot stay. It cannot stay because we're unstoppable. We cannot be stopped because we have the Word of God on the inside of us this day in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet real quick. Take a hold of the hand that's standing beside you. We release the blessing of God into this person. God, you have tremendous promises in each one of us. That's, that's a little bombshell in each one of us. Some of us has, has uh, the, the promise for missions. Some of us has a promise for healing. Some of us have a, 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 a promise for relationships or marriage or, 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 or children. We have it, but God, it has a, it has, that has enough power to release that into somebody else. So this morning, we're going to believe because we're holding the hand of a promise. We're holding the hand that we're going to believe the promises in there will heal us, will help us, will rejuvenate, regenerate, will cause us to think and to come alive. Thank you, Father, for a transfer all this morning. Only what's of you now, Lord Jesus. But thank you for what's coming across our line. I thank you for that that's coming into me, that health, that healing, that restoration, that power that gets the job done. Thank you now for whatever I face today, we can handle it. Whatever we need to do today, we can do it. Whatever tax message we receive, we'll do it with gladness. And whatever we have to send, we'll do it with an anointing. Thank you, Father. We're not the same as we come in here. We're empowered by a promise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. On your bikes, see you now at uh, 630, unless you're going to some seaside resort. Anyway, hopefully I'll see you tonight in Jesus' name. If you don't, you'll have to get the CD next week. <laughs>